Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Shrike, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art and Not Sorry Art School. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari, and today is part two of a two-part series on inspiration versus copying. In part one, I was lucky enough to get to talk to Winton Yates, who is a entertainment attorney who specializes in intellectual property law. Basically, the exact person you would want to talk to about protecting your artwork. In that episode, we really lay out the framework of where does the law protect you? What is the distinction between copying and inspiration? How to protect yourself against AI art and the threat that that is for visual artists. So if you're interested in any of that, I'm going to encourage you to listen to that episode. This episode is a little bit more about my personal experience and sort of the things I did to cope with that. Spoiler for the episode, I did not choose to go the legal route. That's not to say that that was the right or the wrong decision. And I do think that next time if something similar happens with a different body of work, I might approach it slightly differently. But I wanted to walk you through my thoughts and my hopes for the art community and how we can better look out for each other and create a world where artists don't feel scared to copy people and still respect the integrity and the finances of artists. If you're curious about that or if that sounds interesting to you, please stay tuned and enjoy this week's episode. So I think it's important to start out with my experience in college because that's where I first took art classes and learned about anything art related and the takeaway in college was very much that nothing is original, that all art is a remix or a derivative of something else no matter how unique you think you are. In fact I have a very vivid memory of my college painting professor talking to a bunch of us upper level painters and somebody was saying that they wanted to make something very unique and he stopped him in his tracks and said listen if one of your big goals as an artist is to purely come up with something unique that's fine but you're going to be in for a really hard career because no matter how unique something you think an idea is most of the time there's someone who's already made something very similar he also told us about the idea around parallel thought and parallel thought is something that happens quite a bit and it's basically two people coming up with a very similar if not the same idea having no contact with one another this is something that just happens to add to this in college one of the tools that we used to learn was a master study and a master study is basically where a student as a learning device will recreate the painting of a master painter i think i did a bunch of john sloan paintings and a maybe an edward hopper you know the goal isn't to copy exactly per se it's it's very much a process focused um, exercise where you're trying to learn the language metaphorically of the painter and you're trying to learn how they created a painting what their process looked like as a way to begin to understand how other painters work with painting a lot of it in the beginning can feel overwhelming and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can sort of jump into another artist's style as a starting point. The understanding, of course, is that with artistic integrity, you might start out very closely mimicking or using the style of a painter, in this case, a master painter. But if you're in a quest for your own creative expression, you very quickly swim away and find your own style. That's certainly what happened to us in art school. Another thing about art school is we didn't have a bunch of business classes. We certainly didn't have a legal briefing on what copying versus inspiration was. The funny thing about it when I think back to college is that there was so much conversation around plagiarism when it came to papers and very little conversation around it when it came to art. And I think it's tough because art is such a hard thing to really legislate. You know, visual language is so wide and encompassing. You can feed a paper into software and it can tell you where exact sentences are copied and with visual art it's quite a bit more difficult to do that. So cut to a few years later as a little baby artist in about 2017-2018 all of a sudden um, my artwork started to gain some traction on Instagram and on Pinterest and the first case of someone copying my work cropped up 
And I remember my gut instinct with these little floral paintings was just to sit and watch it happen. This other artist was on a whole different hemisphere for me and the painting skill level was different even though it was the same work. And anyways, I watched it unfold. She was definitely copying my work and selling it as her own for months. But then she started doing her own subject matter in that style. And after a few months, she was really doing her own thing. And this to me mimicked very much the trajectory of what happened with us in our master study so I think this really reinforced my everyone has artistic integrity everyone's doing the best they can and I didn't really become critical of this mindset until cut to a couple years later so I would be remiss to not talk about my disco ball paintings on this podcast I think people want to hear about that I will just preface by saying I recorded this and then deleted it because I don't want this episode to seem like I'm spilling tea or complaining you're gonna have to take my word for it that I have largely worked through this and have really found some peace and resolve hopefully you'll understand why by the end of the episode so we're not mad at anyone we don't need to to tag or be unkind I think everyone is doing the best they can is everyone doing what I would do no certainly but I do think at the end of the day people are trying their best it's a hard thing to make it in the art world and so I have a tremendous amount of understanding for all of this and I know I can say that largely because I have the privilege of having other streams of income with my art and I had a large enough platform that it didn't completely put me under so I'm gonna tread forward and you guys have to promise to not read into this and really take this as something that again has resolved I might do stuff differently going forward but I'm at a good place. You're going to have to trust me. (laughs) Okay, so the disco balls. I came up with this idea in the summer of 2019. I had a bunch of these circle canvases in my studio. I... I always pick up circle and square canvases despite the fact that they are notoriously hard to make work as a composition but I had this tradition with my my son I have two kids now I had one kid at the time and it's that we dance to disco music and on 70 Saturday and the reason behind it is you know my husband and I had very different backgrounds he has a lot of things that he can share with the kids like our children have exposure to his parents and they go over to his childhood home all the time and there's lots of traditions and things that my husband can share with the kids. My childhood was totally night and day different from his. I don't have a childhood home I can take them to. There's a lot of space between my parents and my kids and there's not a lot of cute stories that are young child friendly that I can share with them and so I don't have a lot I can share with them but the one thing is my mom and I used to go thrift shopping on Saturdays and we'd clean the house and 70 Saturday was always on so it felt like a tradition that I could share with my kid to like crank the music dance to disco in the backyard and we did that and I remember ideas don't usually happen like this they usually don't pop into your head (laughs) but I was dancing in the backyard and I was like I know exactly what to do with that circle canvas and I didn't know if it'd work out I've always been a, been a really big fan of like optical illusions and things like that and I painted a disco ball in there it's wonky I'll try to include it in the show notes but it was really cool and it was one of the first paintings I made that truly like blew up on Instagram at least relative to my audience and it went viral and it sold immediately. I started making more of them. I got better and this body of work was really transformative because it was lucrative enough for me that I was able to transition from being part-time to full-time and it really helped me to sort of get my career together it was huge huge blessing and I was just really grateful for it and it was fun and authentic and I love painting them very quickly I think maybe my second disco ball I went ahead and did a tutorial because people were interested you know people were saying I want one I can't afford it and I'm always so sympathetic to that so my solution was tell you what I'll show you exactly step by step how I did it you can paint your own so this shows you kind of my mindset around this right I think in hindsight these earlier demos that I made perhaps maybe gave the impression that I was just giving full permission for people to like set up shop and make disco balls and claim it as their own. I didn't think I had to spell it out quite so much, but I do think if you are going to learn from my mistakes, that if you do give out sort of a tutorial component of what you're doing, just ask people to tag you and give credit. I think that that's a pretty reasonable thing to ask. I have always felt pretty abundant or like 
not super productive. I've always thought art is meant to be shared and cut to about a year later and maybe a little less than a year later. I'm not really sure, but (laughs) copies start to pop up. And that's, again, if people aren't calling it their own idea, if they're just, if they're tagging me, you know, even if they're selling them at a lower clip, I'm at this point, I'm still fine, but cut to about a year later and something would happen on TikTok. So TikTok is an app that has a lot of capacity for virality. And so what would happen is people would mimic The disco balls, you know, do do use my tutorial very clearly. It's a very specific style. And people would either forget to tag me or not. And then it would blow up. And then people would say, hey, don't forget to tag the creator. And sometimes they wouldn't, sometimes they wouldn't. Either way, it just kind of existed. And it started to kind of feel like a game of whack-a-mole keeping up with it. Because again, I don't mind if people make them. I don't mind if they go viral off of them. I don't mind if they sell couple knockoffs in their Etsy store like it's it's really it's hard for me to explain but it's again it's all about like those power structures right like if you are a peer or you're a bigger artist or your video goes way viral and big companies are reaching out to you to do partnerships over the disco balls that's where personally I started to have the first ever in my whole career these sensations of like oh that doesn't feel right And to be honest, it's hard to talk about even now because anytime I would express this like, hey, like I would really like, you know, the credit for that, like that sort of sentiment, people are very quick to call you names and say that you're being scarce or that you're not being generous or kind. But the fact of the matter is that once these really took off, once enough people sort of made them without tagging and they got enough eyes on them, it did affect my bottom line and and my ability to sell them. And when I would pitch them to galleries, there were a couple cases where someone had already seen them. Or if I would show up to an art show, there would be another painter who their whole thing was selling the disco balls. And the reason I didn't kind of go after things sooner and I didn't make a big stink right when it started happening was twofold. One, I just had a belief that if people were making art, that they were making it for their own artistic integrity and even if they started painting disco balls they'd eventually move on to their own style or whatever and and they were just really lucrative and so I understand why someone would continue to make them and maybe deviate from that artistic integrity for a quick buck it's hard to make it in the art world but yeah it's it's sort of snowballed and for the first time ever I did have to sort of sit and think critically about why does this hurt is it a me problem am I actually just being like a bad person and I I should just be more generous where does all this come from and I think it's important to bring up the privilege conversation and understandably people might be rolling their eyes at this point in the podcast but I around this time also had an online art school that was starting to bring in a little bit of more stable income I had bought my own printer one of the good things about growing up incredibly poor and having to really scrape and scrimp and be on a shoestring budget basically until my late 20s is that I was always sort of planning for the floor to drop out from underneath me and I was able to sort of weather the storm, pivot, find different work to do and, you know, just move and roll with the punches with all of this, right? The thing that always kind of breaks my heart and the reason why I maybe didn't just stay quiet about it and and just completely let it go is because if I had been an artist where everything was the same except for I was a smaller artist, or everything was the same and I was part of a more marginalized group, or if I was an artist who struggled with a health condition and they couldn't paint every single day in the way that I can paint, what happened to me would have put someone out of business. Like it was a big enough hit that if the disco balls were my whole thing, and I see a lot of artists out there who their paintings are a study, a deep dive into one very specific thing. Not gonna lie, I have a lot of respect for those artists. (laughs) I think it's so cool. But if something like this had happened to someone who worked more in that style or had other limitations, this would have been devastating. And so again, I think that's why I'm making this podcast. I made part one because I think there are things that you could have taken from that first podcast and applied them right before things got to a tipping point and it could have helped, you know, you could have sent a cease and desist. You could have talked to the artist and say, hey, you can sell these. Please tag me. If a company reaches out to you, please say, you can work with me. This is a derivative idea. And and just be in community with one another, right? Things don't have to devolve into lawsuits or anything messy. You can resolve these things with just community and 
communication. The disco balls are the most, I think, obvious case of this. It's going to be hard for me to explain, but the disco balls weren't actually the hardest part of this whole thing. There was another scenario where an artist who had like loosely been buddies with me, who had always sort of, the interesting thing, and the reason I'm bringing this up is as a commentary on sort of the scarcity and competition in the art world, especially I think between feminine presenting artists, because there is such a scarcity. But there had been an, an artist who was a peer for a long time. There had been this relationship where they could be inspired by my work, but it didn't seem that they would tolerate it going the other direction. I'm in very much the kind of person where I have always known that I'm an ideas person. And so I try to have a really abundant and gracious mindset when it comes to that. But the other person seemed to me to be bothered by my ability to frequently come up with new ideas. Shortly after I started to notice these issues, they blocked me unprovoked. It was strange because nothing was made clear about why that happened, and it really just left me with a bunch of questions. Admittedly, this situation, this back and forth, has caused me to be a little bit more careful with who I am friends with and how I react to other people in the art world. Again, if there's another theme that emerges out of this, it's my naivety with these things. And I've grown since to understand that there's scarcity in the art world and that sort of the side effect of commoditizing ideas and inspiration things that are the backbone of art is that something that usually is pretty free-flowing and light can become really scarce and and people can feel really unwilling to share and give credit in a, in a way that isn't really helpful a brief example of this was during the pandemic i remember i would go live and I had a painting that was in process behind me of, of ring pops and it was a huge painting. And then the next day after this, that the other person posted a ring pop painting and okay, that's not a big deal. I wouldn't bring it up if it was just that, I promise. But what ended up happening is once I posted mine, there was a campaign that I was copying them <laughs> and my painting was shared to an account they were working with that had a million followers and it was credited to that person and it was just to the point where between the disco ball and this other person's battle with scarcity and their own problems that they were having i realized in the span of a few months that not everyone is operating out of that artistic integrity and that was a really hard lesson to learn because i i largely have a belief that people are good and especially artists are good i really am a champion of artists but needless to say, my worldview had been challenged. I had gone from being one of those people who maybe would have felt pretty turned off if somebody was really committed to protecting their art in a way that felt like they were overblowing it, to all of a sudden I had an incredible amount of empathy for that. And also I think it's important to mention at this point that there's a cultural element that I didn't necessarily experience, right? copying isn't just flattery people say that a lot and i think the intention of that sentiment that copying is just flattery is is well intentioned but if it's if someone's taking something and profiting off of it that is an interesting and heavy and complicated transaction so again with a cultural thing if somebody who has no connection to a culture is taking and profiting it flattery or not you're still there's a transaction there that you have to be really sensitive to and so I think at this point of the podcast if you're someone who really has a everything's fair game let's just copy each other and be fine with it kind of approach I would just urge you to maybe soften and understand how and why there could be situations where that transaction doesn't just feel like flattery and it can really challenge not only your economic situation but it can feel like something's being taken hey all i just wanted to let you know that i'm hosting a painting retreat march 22nd through 27th in the beautiful texas hill country of wimberley texas i'll be teaching my still life and landscape techniques as we relax on a hundred acre property situated 45 minutes away from downtown austin there are five unique lodging accommodations to choose from plus a drive-in option for local guests we'll be enjoying chef prepared meals so every single meal of the day is already provided for you and soak in all the inspiration that the beautiful property has to offer and y'all if you haven't been down to the texas hill country it is so stunning all the locals vacation out there it's a lot of beauty and nature and hopefully we're going to be super inspired by that as we learn plein air painting and lots of other great technique
So sign up today by heading over to my website, sari.studio, and clicking the Texas Painting Retreat tab. I hope to see you there. It's going to be a blast. Okay, so how did I deal with all this, right? I'm at a point where now I'm officially frustrated. I'm frustrated with a past version of myself for thinking this was just a two-dimensional, easy-to-solve situation. I'm frustrated with my current situation where I can really struggling to make a body of work work and now when I paint these disco balls what had been a very fun abstract color field experience now has dread. I find myself getting tagged in other people's disco ball posts by followers who are pointing it out that the artist hasn't tagged me or given credit to me. What do I do right? The thing I value most in my creative practice is my headspace. <laughs> I really value the openness that I'm able to fill my day with where I can just sit, go on a walk, meditate, be with my kids, whatever. And because I kind of have this space and this emptiness, I come up with all my ideas like just doing that. And I found myself having less and less of that time because of the stress around this copying thing and this other person who had this weird hang up with me. Between these two things, I found myself in a position where I no longer had that headspace. And that was the turning point where I said, okay, I've got to deal with this head on. I've got to devote a session of therapy to this. I got to work through this. And what I ended up doing was saying that I'm going to have to let this go. My headspace is more important. One of the things I did was I really leaned into teaching. I'm a kind of person who, when I'm in the process of working through something and letting it go, that does not look passive for me. It does for other people and I think it's fantastic. There's no right or wrong way to deal with things, right? As long as you're not hurting anyone. But for me, I have to take action. And so I made a YouTube tutorial that was really in depth. The other thing that I did to help was I really hammered out my artist statement. I put words and meaning to why this body of work was really special. And from that point on, when I shared new artwork or new ideas, I always shared an element of that, that even if that work got replicated, something about the story, something about how I was connected to it was unique. And I will say, again, on the bright side, I ended up being able to write a wickedly good artist statement after this because... I learned that, okay, somebody could copy your work exactly, but they're never going to be able to copy or mimic or recreate your passion, your uniqueness as a person, your worldview as an artist. And so I found myself leaning more into those things. I think the silver lining of that is not only did I become better at writing artist statements, but I found a lot of peace and ease and gratitude for my writing practice that I don't think had that happened, I don't think I would have that still. I think I would, that would have been underutilized. Another thing I did was I tried really hard to cultivate compassion for the other person. The disco ball specifically situation people, I understood that the art world is scarce and that if they went from not being able to make money off of their previous work to being able to have brand deals and success with this work, that because I had the space and privilege, yes, if I could let that go, I could understand why someone would do that. And again, it's easier said than done. And again, it didn't happen overnight, but I really tried to cultivate passion. And for the person who had this weird sort of copying scarcity relationship, I learned to really lean into that person as a teacher and as a tool and I think I've grown from it pretty tremendously. So I know it sounds like hokey, but I really am out of spot where I have gratitude for both of these experiences. I think going forward, if I went through something similar again, I would lean into communication in a way that I didn't the first time with both of these situations. Not to say that that would solve it, but I think I could do a better job maybe protecting myself, but it happened the way it did. And truthfully, the disco balls, while they're still really fun, I have worked through a lot of what was interesting about them and maybe if they were still the lucrative juggernaut that they were when I cornered the market on them, I would still be painting them and the fact that I'm not, I think I had worked through it largely. I still think they're fun. They're Like I said, they're very meditative and they're cute and I like them and they're a big part of my branding, but I have a freedom with them that I don't know that I would have had had this not happened. So again, I'm trying to really give you understanding how I let go of these things. So it was a heavy practice of reminding myself of those things, of the fact that I can 
let this go. So I should let this go. And I just want to be clear, the disco balls are still a good portion of what I do and how I show up in the world. Some people know me only through the disco balls. The prints are something that keep my lights on <laughs> and my bills paid. So it's not to say that this body of work has completely disappeared for me but I will say when it comes to tracking people down and trying to claim it I, I think it's the cat's out of the bag in that sense and so I'm pretty resigned to just you know for the most part continue with what I'm doing the other thing that I put my energy into was creating this podcast and I thought about doing it as a YouTube video I, I wrote it out a couple of times and included everything and then I've refined it and now it's what you're listening to now. And as I sort of wrap up this episode, I wanted to talk about sort of the final, what I would consider the cherry on top of all of this. And this is sort of a plea to anyone. This is going to get a little more into the like <laughs> therapy woo-woo realm. So if, if this is all you wanted to know, here's your point to check out of the podcast. But the last thing is, you know, like I said, I got to a point where I could see the silver lining. It helped my writing. It helped my artist statement I made this YouTube video and just shared it and let everyone just make it and just completely let go and it lives on the internet now it's no big deal it's yours take it and I kept feeling this like weird nagging every once in a while of like there wasn't a resolve even though like the front of my mind or like the more rational part of my mind was over this and I was and I didn't want to do anything different than what I was doing despite the fact that I got to this point Every once in a while, as I was falling asleep, <laughs> I would get this jolt of like, ah, oh, but the injustice of it all. And that's exactly kind of what it felt like. And there wasn't a ton of logic to it. Because like I said, I chose, I, I'm a big girl, I'm a grown up, I chose my decisions and I was really pretty content with it. But I think upon further research, the reason why people might really struggle with this, of course, outside of the like, if this is financially cut into you. I, I'm not talking at this point to anyone who has meaningful concerns, right? Someone's taken something that's sensitive to your culture. Someone has taken something that's kept you from being able to pay bills. Let's table that and say that you've come to peace, but there's this last little nagging in your heart. For me, of course, like most things, it's it did stem back to childhood. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with a parent who consequences didn't apply to them. So I grew up in a pretty authoritarian household where there was really rigid rules, boundaries, consequences for us children. But one of my parents didn't have those and they would abuse alcohol and become very angry and frustrated and violent and do and say terrible, terrible things. And then they would pass out. <laughs> and the next morning, we all as a family had to pretend it didn't happen and just had to move on and immediately jump to joking around, hanging, pretend, like stepping around holes in the wall or, you know, like cleaning up the carnage and like pretending like nothing had happened. And because of this, I think I became someone who was really, really, really sensitive and maybe had a displaced sense of of justice where I would vacillate between feeling like I deserve no justice because that's what I grew up with and then this weird almost painful sense of oh you deserve all the justice and I think this really lack of regulation was because I had never really processed or dealt with that trauma and that's going to look different for everyone. I, I really encourage you to work this out with a mental health care professional. I'm not going to try to even remotely step into that role or, you know, just proceed with caution. But I was able to, with my health care provider, work through what that looked like and what justice looked like to that version of me and how I could promise justice in my current life more in my family structure than my work life. But that was the final piece for me to realize when this emotion cropped up to really examine it and ask myself, did this make sense with what was happening to me in my career? Or was this a piece of eight-year-old Sari that was still hurting? And again, I know this is like the woo-woo part of the podcast, but working through that has helped me emotionally process this so much more than any other part of the conversation. And if nothing else, then for that little piece of advice, I hope it brings someone peace and understanding. Maybe if you're the kind of person who 
you're almost too afraid to make art because the prospect of someone copying you, not giving you credit and running away with your idea hurts you almost physically, that might be an indicator that there's some work to be done. Of course, protect yourself. Like I said, look at the first podcast, listen to that. I provided a resource page, reach out to community, reach out to people to have your back if this happens. But if you're working through something that seems to go further than those resources, that might be the missing part of the conversation. And so I'm wrapping up today's episode with kind of like what I would say is the final call to the art community, to anyone who's made it to this point in the podcast, which is that we have to look out for each other. The law doesn't always completely cover all of the ethics and courtesy of copying and inspiration. And I know in either one of these podcasts, I I didn't super explicitly go into where copying ends and inspiration starts because I think truly that's one of those things where it's sort of between you and the artist and the other artist or the person copying and I think it's a hard thing for me to try to explain over a podcast but I would say trust your gut, listen to your instincts and reach out to your community. If you feel like something's happening and you want to talk to a friend or another fellow artist who maybe is working in a similar space, you know, ask them, what's the protocol here? I've, I have um, an online art school and we do weekly chats and I've had people ask questions about this all the time. And I think sometimes it's helpful to hear from other artists. And then if you see a smaller artist getting their work copied, again, especially if it's culturally sensitive or they're really small or they have a limitation that makes it a little extra imbalanced as far as power, look out for each other, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to other people in your space and communicate because a lot of times there are deals you can make, there's compromises to be made. I think we're all trying to do the best we can, especially if we're operating with that artistic integrity. So I don't know if this was super helpful. Hopefully there's something you can glean from this episode This isn't to say that I think that I'm an authority on this or that I handled things right or wrong. I really will probably always sort of have to process this a little bit, but that's kind of what I went through. That's my thoughts. I I still have a pretty open approach to all of this, and I know that might set me up for this happening again in the future. I think I might operate a little bit differently going forward, but I really like my headspace, and I really like being part of a community where I teach, and you guys learn and listen, and I learn from you, and I want to keep that channel open. So thank you for listening to this podcast. (laughs) Hopefully it made sense. And protect yourself. Look out for yourself. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. A huge thank you to everyone who listened today. And I hope that people are walking away from this podcast with a little bit more of a nuanced understanding of what a situation like this can look like and can play out like. More importantly, I hope you walk away from this knowing that copying is going to affect different people in different ways and that we owe it to each other to be cognizant of what our size and scale and reach and you know other things about our art practice can affect when it comes to other artists I think it's important to still create with limitless abandon and and creative integrity but still kind of understanding that there's a line that might affect people's income and really it's just a plea for compassion and understanding when it comes to why another artist might be scared or nervous of their work getting ripped off I also want to say a huge thank you to everyone who left five-star reviews. This helps small channels like the Not Sorry Art Podcast grow. I just launched earlier this month, so, you know, it's a it's a small thing, and when you guys leave reviews, it really helps. So to the two reviews that were left this week, Sally Evans Fine Art, thank you so much, and Jackie Hansen Art, thank you guys both so much for leaving your reviews. I appreciate you. If you would like to have your Instagram handle read off, at the end of next week's episode please leave a review let me know what you think of the podcast